The sun had just risen over the jewel of Kathiawad, Jamnagar. While most of the city was asleep on this early Monday morning of 10th October 2011, two fighter pilots wearing G suits, flight suits, made their way towards their assigned MiG 29s. Their task for today was a routine sortie where the two pilots would practice dogfight scenarios. The first protocol after getting into their plane was to check their flight instruments. Fuel check. Systems check. And use their call signs to radio the air traffic controller. Viper here requesting permission to taxi. Duke requesting follow up. Back in the air control tower, a young officer with only 6 months of experience under his belt was manning the station. You're clear for OPR takeoff. OPR or operational ready platforms meaning each would take off from different ends of the 3 and a half thousand meter runway soon the aircrafts from IAF's 28th squadron roared into the sky as they reached a comfortable cruising altitude of 30000 feet they got ready to perform their first task which was a supersonic intercept mission a simulated confrontation to rehearse how a pilot would respond if an enemy aircraft were to violate our airspace They positioned themselves a hundred kilometers apart from each other, with Viper simulating as the bogey, and Duke would rehearse an aggressive interception and, if necessary, a shoot down. All electronically, of course. If this were a real-life scenario, then Duke would have unleashed a cluster of missiles, with the deadliest being the Bimpel R-73 heat-seeking air-to-air missile that would head straight towards the unwelcome intruder. That morning, both aircraft were fully loaded. weighing 81.3 kilonewtons so as to mimic an actual simulation but there would be no firing this brutal air drill was conducted purely to hone flying reflexes and practice sops standard operating procedures in the event of a hostile air intrusion the 28th squadron of the indian air force operating a pack of 18 mig 29s is code named the first supersonics for being the first squadron to be equipped with a fighter that could break the sound barrier the mig 21 in the late 1960s and though the mig could easily throttle up over twice the speed of sound the if kept their velocities in check over densely populated areas as the loud boom that fighter jets produce when they break the sound barrier can shatter window panes on the ground and even caused panic among the population Viper initiated the first maneuver for the drill by taking a 120 km outward turn from Jamnagar towards the mainland to simulate the intrusion as he pulled up the aircraft positioned head on with the sun which flooded the cockpit with blinding light the pilot then adjusted his oxygen mask and pulled down the tinted visor to protect his eyes in ready position for the maneuver Suddenly his aircraft's HUD heads up display a pane of glass on the aircraft's dashboard which superimposes instrument readings and mission data into the pilot's viewpoint flickered and blanked out a fraction of a second later viper spotted the cause for the blank HUD it was a tiny spark that had the beginnings of a small fire but it could also be that a classic case of hypoxia was messing with the pilot's mind lack of oxygen is known to lead to hallucinations So at first Viper thought that someone had just lit a matchstick and offered him a cigarette but no while the fire looked like a matchstick flame about the size of an index finger it was escalating quickly ominously filling the cockpit with thick black smoke the immediate danger was the 4000 liters of fuel in a series of overhead tanks in the fuselage and wings that could easily ignite if the fire spread Viper tried to keep his voice as calm as possible and radioed the ATC. Viper reporting a fire in the cockpit. The stun controller wasn't sure if he had heard correctly. Viper, did you just say fire? Can you confirm it? I repeat, there's a fire in my cockpit. Is it an engine fire? fire. No, I repeat, it's a cockpit fire. I'm turning urgently back towards base. Need guidance and permission to descend. Viper O A D A D five. Let's get you out of there, sir. Let's get you home. Flying 60 kilometers to the east, and on the same radio frequency, Viper's wingman Bu heard the terse radio exchange. With permission from the ground, he immediately swerved his jet towards the burning aircraft to see if he could help from outside. But really, there was nothing he could do. The first thing Viper did was check his oxygen supply. Luckily, he could breathe, and the oxygen was stable. The good news meant that he was not hallucinating, but the bad news was that he was now positive that he had a good and proper fire burning. In under 60 seconds not only had the pilot spotted the fire but had started taking recovery actions though at that time a minute seemed like an eternity 
First, he tried to douse the spreading flames with his gloves. But the plan backfired as the strands of molten plastic got stuck onto his fire-resistant gloves and he could feel his fingers burning. The odor of smoke, like that of burning plastic, was choking him. <coughs> and to make matters worse, the smoke was depositing a layer of soot on the aircraft's canopy, blocking out his visibility. Hearing about the emergency, many officers rushed towards ground control. Even though they couldn't do much while the aircraft was still in mid-air, except for shouting, Eject! 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 The option to eject was always there, but Viper felt he still had some chance to land his aircraft safely. Oh, 40 clicks away. Keep coming if you can. With constant guidance from the tower, he flew towards base, maintaining a low altitude of 1,000 feet. But the flight map indicated a more prominent danger ahead of him in a matter of minutes. A danger that no pilot in the history of the IAF had ever faced. Bang in his path lay Reliance's massive oil refinery, which is a strictly no-fly zone. No aircraft was allowed to fly within a 2km radius. And yet, here he was, flying at less than a third of a kilometre. Flying a burning MiG, armed with deadly missiles and laden with petrol making its way at breakneck speed towards the giant facility. What would happen if the MiG were to crash into India's biggest refinery? He would die for sure, but he would crash the country's entire economy along with him. So in a desperate bid to gain height, Viper dumped fuel to lighten the aircraft and tried to gain altitude. Viper's wingman, Duke, radioed the beleaguered pilot. Come on Viper, you can't just crash here. Puta Bai would be very angry with us. As the MiG gained altitude, Viper reduced speed to lessen its boom and went into a barrel roll with its belly up in order to gain height and avoid crashing into the refinery. But this also meant putting the balance of his burning aircraft in jeopardy. If he did handle the roll well, he would end up doing the very thing he wanted to avoid, crash. But in a matter of just 15 seconds, the danger passed as the refinery was left behind and he corrected the aircraft. Viper could see the ATC tower now and expertly guided his burning aircraft with help from ground control and landed without incident. Coming out shaken but not stirred. Later, when the Air Force called the refinery to check, Was there any damage caused by the aircraft's boom? Nothing, other than heavy winds today. Viper's story is a real-life incident of Wing Commander Ajit Bhaskar Vasane a graduate of the 103rd course of the National Defence Academy, who went on to win a Shorya Chakra the following year for safely landing this very flight during a supersonic practice intercept mission. The citation award read, With exceptional presence of mind and courage, he avoided flying over petrochemical installations in the vicinity of the airfield, even though this prolonged fight endangered his personal life. He was lucky that his MiG landed. These very MiGs, both the 21s and the 29s, have been responsible for 400 plus incidents and 295 crashes since 1963, resulting in the death of over 200 IAF pilots and more than 60 civilians. Leading it to be dubbed flying coffins and widow maker by the media and even by some members of the Air Force for its crash frequency. But after a sixth aircraft crashed within 19 months on May 8, 2023, killing two IAF pilots, the whole fleet was grounded for technical checks. Amir Khan also highlighted this in his hit movie Rang De Basanti of how a close college gang came to terms with life when one of their mates, an IAF pilot, died in a faulty make during a routine training exercise. Though military aviation is inherently dangerous as machines are often stretched to their limits, this kind of crash rate is alarming. The 872 MiG-21s were India's first supersonic fighters bought from the then Soviet Union in 1963 as a counter to Pakistan's F-104s bought from the US. They served us well in the wars of 1965 and 1971 and were due to be phased out in the 1980s when newer models of the MiG were bought, the MiG-29s. These MiG-29s helped India immensely in the 1999 Kargil War because they could deploy medium to long-range PVR missiles, preventing Pakistani F-16s from providing support to its ground forces in Kargil. In the mid-1980s, HAL, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, was entrusted with designing and producing India's new fleet of fighters. The Russian Sukhois, the Su-30 MKIs developed by them under license, has been a big success. 
and the IAF's 250 plus Sukhois are expected to form the backbone of its air force in the 2020s and beyond. The Sukhois played a stellar role in repulsing Pakistan's planned Feb 2019 attack on Noshera in the 16th Corps headquarters in response to India's Balakot strike. When Wing Commander Abhinandan chased retreating Pakistani F-16s all the way back into their territory. But HAL's failure to produce indigenous aircraft over the last few decades means the IAF is still flying planes made in the 1980s, including the MiG-21 Bisons, MiG-29s, Mirage 2000 and Sepikat Jaguars which are continually being upgraded for combat readiness. For example, with a Zook M Plus Doppler electronically scanned array radar that can attack 10 targets and engage 4 at once. The partial glass cockpit is now HOTAS, hands-on throttle and stick capable with a French navigation system and new video recorders and map generators. What has improved is avionics and armament. However, the engine remains the same, making it essentially still a 35-year-old product. It's like taking a souped-up 1960s 40 model car to an F1 race. The much-acclaimed Tejas LCA light combat aircraft has been highly delayed and still has issues because HAL is unable to develop a stable engine. Barring the 36 Rafales and 40 Tejas Mark I jets, there have been no fresh inductions or orders in the past few decades. Resulting in a depletion of fighter squadron strength to 32, far less than the 42 we would need in case of a two-front war against Pakistan and China simultaneously. At the earlier order for 126 Rafale fighters signed during UPA-2 in 2011-12 been completed, India would be much better placed today. But politics derailed that and eventually only 36 Rafale jets, enough for two squadrons instead of seven came in, albeit at a slightly cheaper cost. When Prime Minister Modi was French President Emmanuel Macron's chief guest at Bastille Day in July 2023, he was expected to remedy the situation by placing a further order of 26 Rafale marine fighter jets. But he didn't. Though just a month earlier during his June 2023 trip to the US, GE confirmed that they will produce their F-414 engines with 80% technology transfer jointly with HAL enabling it to overcome its biggest stumbling block of a dependable engine by which India can replace its 83 MiG-21 Bisons with the Tejas LCA Mark 1A within the next three years. Not only Bisons, other aging squadrons of Jaguars, Mirages and MiG-29s would also need to be retired soon thereafter. The other extremely accident-prone military aircraft are the ALH, Advanced Light Helicopters Dhruv, Rudras, Cheetah and Chetak where on a misty morning on December 8, 2021, in the mountains of Kunur, Chief of Defence Staff General Rawat and his wife became the most prominent victims of the over 200 crashes in the last 30 years that claimed 297 lives in non-military situations. And while Augusta Westland helicopters were bought for VVIP movement, on which we did a story earlier, the ALH often used in search and rescue missions like for the hunt of our Jawans in the AN-32 crash in Arunachal must see that incredible story on Bisbo. They are also crucial for supply chain to forward bases where larger planes cannot reach. But because of the chopper's unreliability, they are increasingly being replaced by mules for last mile delivery. This is the next area where attention must be paid. India's brave and capable fighter pilots need aircraft that can support them and our flying coffins must be buried forever. Baseball's Limerick The MiG fighter jets are now past their prime. All our pilots who died, what was their crime? Flying aging machines fighting above their means, we need an effective deterrent at wartime. You will also find these sources listed in our video description section.